Well, um, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. It's a special pleasure to continue our Global Immune Talk series with another spectacular speaker, Anna Molovsky. Um, and I'll briefly introduce uh, Anna. Anna is a molecular neuroscientist and other psychiatrist. Her group studies um, functional connections between the immune system and the brain, with a particular focus on homeostatic roles of neuroimmune signaling during brain development, learning, and memory. She has really identified a stunning number of novel mechanisms through which microglia cells regulate function of synapses. And this uh, included, for instance, remodeling of the synaptic extracellular matrix via cytokines such as IL-33, uh, her lab is also studying the role of innate lymphoid sites during brain cell development and how other cytokines impact the brain, the development of the brain, brain function, behavior. Anna has received uh, several uh, spectacular prizes, an NIH New Inva uh, Innovator Award, a Pew Biomedical Scholar Award, or uh, the Friedman Prize from the Brain and uh, Behavior Research Foundation. Um, concerning her career, she completed undergrad studies or undergrad tra undergraduate training in neuroscience and chemistry at Amherst College. She received an MD PhD degree from the University of Michigan, and uh, she participated in the medical scientist uh, training program, so an MSDP program. She then did her residency in adult psychiatry at UCSF. Uh, obtained training from the Psychoanalytical Institute, and she's ever since a faculty member and is running a faculty practice uh, at UCSF at the Langley Porter Psychiatric Institute. And uh, in parallel to that, and that's really stunning, uh, she managed all this uh, clinical training in addition to establishing a very productive lab. I think this is something uh, not so common. I'm always uh, highly appreciating this if you manage both clinical and uh, academic and research. And uh, with this, I would like to come to my essentially starting question. If you look back at yourself and say, when I was a postdoc, or maybe when I was 25 or 35, I think that's not so long ago, I guess. But um, if you look at that period and now if you look at your career, what kind of advice would you have given to yourself or what kind of advice would you give to people in a similar situation? Hi, Dietmar. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks to the hosts for inviting me to speak at this. It's very exciting. Um, I should say, by the way, well, I could give a lot of advice. First of all, um, to your introduction, I would say that I am a clinician scientist, but I think it's important to be focused and um, make choices. And so I, I don't do very much clinical work these days. I think in order to do one thing really well, I, you know, you may need to make difficult choices, even though there's many interesting things in the world. Um, and as far as advice to myself, I would say um, I lacked confidence that I would be able to succeed as a scientist until at least halfway through my postdoc. Um, looking back on it now, and when I look at trainees that I work with, I, I can see the potential in them, but I realize how hard it is to see it in yourself when you're going through it. Um, everything feels like it could collapse and fail um, until it hasn't. And so I, you know, I see a lot of kind of cynicism on Twitter and um, it's a very anxious kind of a career, but I hope that people can sort of stay connected to the love of science and, and not lose confidence. It would have made the training process less stressful for me. So... I think this is a, a very good point. Although I actually even sometimes think people who are very critical are usually the best. You know, sort of this of questioning yourself: Am I doing the right thing? I would say this is probably for career a very important thing. Actually, true, true. Um, it can also be a little bit miserable. So <laughs> um, you're right. I think it's an important balance. It's probably what brings us into this career, right? That we can be very critical and hard on ourselves. Fully agree. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, but without further delay, uh, it's a pleasure to have you to give the seminar. So please share the screen and stage is all yours. Great. All right. And can everyone see my screen? Excellent. All right, so thank you again for introducing me. You heard a little bit about uh, what my lab works on and the title of my talk is essentially that. 
um, defining neuroimmune circuits one cytokine at a time. Um, <clears throat> and as a psychiatrist, um, I think one of the main things that being a psychiatrist has done for me is really convince me of how important the immune system is uh, for many more brain diseases than we might have previously appreciated. So the field of neuroimmunology was founded in the studies of multiple sclerosis. Um, but since that time, we've come to realize that neuroimmunology, that the immune system impacts diseases that we might not have thought of, including autism, depression, schizophrenia, and many others, of course, neurodegeneration. Um, and yet not all of these diseases have good animal models. Uh, and so my approach to sort of cracking this problem, understanding how the immune system impacts the brain and brain disease is to focus on how immune signaling maintains a healthy brain. We all know, of course, that the immune system plays critical roles in homeostasis. Um, and I just wanna orient you into what we mean uh, and one way to think about um, the function of the brain um, and what it's supposed to do. And this is the concept of experience dependent synapse remodeling. And here's a very simple kind of uh, model neural circuit where you see here in the green neuron and the red neuron, uh, a synaptic connection between these two neurons in the black box. And let's imagine that one neuron encodes a memory of a sunny day. Uh, another neuron is encoding the memory of a very delicious smell. And those neurons, when they fire together, um, bring up uh, a memory of a nice day that you spent um, at a carnival or a boardwalk eating this delicious cake. Um, one day you eat something like this, you become, oh, sorry, you become very ill uh, and these connections need to remodel, right? Um, it is this process of lifelong remodeling in response to experiences um, that we want to study when we study the immune system because it's the conceptually, molecularly, we think it's the same kind of remodeling that happens in the skin, in the lung, in every other tissue in the body. So one big take home point is that the brain is just an organ like any other. And as immunologists, we should uh, consider the brain uh, as one of the things that we study and not throw it away. Um, one of the most uh, well-studied cell types in this concept of um, this concept that the brain has an immune system uh, are microglia. Uh, we didn't even realize microglia were immune cells until somebody knocked out PU.1 and discovered that they had disappeared, right? So it's, it's really very recent in the past 30 or so years um, that microglia have become uh, appreciated as immune cells and studied as such. Here you see a picture of several microglia. You can see their beautiful ramified morphology in a sea of synapses. So each one of these red spots represents a synaptic connection between two neurons. Um, and a major discovery of the past 10 years uh, was uh, by several groups that synaptic proteins are found inside of microglia, which you can see here uh, when we do a reconstruction. Um, and so these cells, which are one of the main uh, brain resident macrophages, not only are the dominant immune cells in the brain parenchyma, but this discovery of synaptic proteins in microglia led to the hypothesis that microglia might actually play a role in circuit development in the brain and not just be there in preparation uh, for something going wrong, for example. And in fact, microglia are 10% of the cells in the brain beginning uh, in the early postnatal, fetal to postnatal transition. So um, they must be doing something we would think. So one topic that I wanna to touch on today, because I think it's important, particularly for people that uh, don't think about microglia every day, is this concept of microglial synapse pruning, um, because it has, um, it's a very evocative term. It's generated a huge amount of excitement and interest in microglia, um, but I wanna be very specific about what the term means, um, because I think it's relevant to how we define molecular and cellular functions of microglia. So that's what I wanna talk about in the next few slides. Um, do act microglia actively eliminate or prune synapses? I would say if the word pruning evokes this image in your mind to you, the idea of clipping off a synapse that is still attached to a neuron, um, I would say that I don't know. And that uh, data from our lab so far 
um, hasn't revealed evidence of this process. Do microglia remodel synapses? Absolutely. But I think the essential thing, what I want to tell in this first story, is that we need to understand um, every step in the multi-step process that leads to this remodeling if we really want to get at um, molecular understanding and therapeutic targets. Um, so there are three parts to my talk. If you don't like microglia, stay tuned for part three, which is uh, about innate lymphocytes. Uh, but in the first two parts of the talk, I want to tackle the concept of how microglia remodel neural circuits. In part one, um, talking about interleukin-33 in um, remodeling of the extracellular matrix. And in part two, uh, a novel role for type 1 interferons in circuit remodeling. In the first part of my talk, um, a lot of this is published. Uh, and it's kind of where my group has made the most progress. It's IL-33 is the cytokine that made me a neuroimmunologist. Um, in collaboration with Ari Malofsky, who has studied uh, IL-33 in the remodeling of other tissues like the lung and adipose tissue. Um, so this work was led by many excellent scientists who have um, all now moved on to their next positions, uh, including Ilya, Raphael, Fee, and Greg. Um, and it started with a very simple observation, which I actually made during my postdoc, uh, which is that IL-33, uh, this canonical tissue resident stromal cytokine, which is made by stromal cells all over the body, um, is also made by astrocytes, which um, in some ways could be considered the fibroblasts of the brain. As you can see here, um, you know, we have two different types of tissue in the brain. We have the white matter where the axon tracts are located, and we have the gray matter, which is where synapses are located. And we noticed that IL-33 using this reporter made by Marco Colonna's lab is exclusively found during development um, embedded amongst synapses, suggesting that it might play a synaptic role. And in fact, as the brain develops, we notice that the expression of IL-33, which you can see here in red, um, increases as synapses mature in these different brain regions at different times. Um, and following up on this initial observation, uh, we eventually identified a model through which astrocytes produce IL-33, which signals to microglia, which we find that in development are the only cell types expressing the IL-33 receptor, also known as uh, ST2 or IL-1 or IL-1, that this signaling me mechanism drives synaptic protein uptake, uh, which then restricts synapse numbers. So this is a homeostatic loop present during healthy brain development um, that involves IL-33 signaling directly to microglia. And so I want to point out that the two core pieces of data that form the basis for this model um, were first that when we administer IL-33, we see an increase in microglial engulfment of synapses, uh, synaptic proteins. Uh, when we knock out IL-33, we see the opposite. And conversely, uh, that when we increase IL-33, we see reduced synapse numbers. And when we knock out IL-33, synapses are present in excess. It is this core relationship here between uh, increased microglial engulfment and decreased synapse numbers, which has been often termed um, microglial synapse pruning, right? And so I would encourage you when you read papers in this topic uh, to notice uh, when it is that this is the relationship that generates the hypothesis uh, and in which cases there's additional data to support that there is direct pruning of synapses by microglia. Um, but we we're very excited that we'd identified a me microglial mediated mechanisms that regulated synapse numbers. And we went on to pursue this idea that microglia engulf synapses. And so we turn next to a completely different circuit where we know that remodeling is also taking place. And this is the adult hippocampus. This is where memories are encoded in the brain. And because memories are being encoded throughout life, this is another circuit in which we expect to see synaptic remodeling, uh, including into adulthood. Um, and so we noticed right away that there's going to be differences in this pathway, first of all, because when you look at the astrocytes here in green, um, most of the IL-33 is being expressed not by astrocytes, but by neurons themselves, which you can see their cell bodies here in red. <clears throat> Zooming in, you can see co-localization of IL-33 with a neuronal marker. So there's a different cell type here. The receptor is still expressed by microglia. So this is a neuron microglial circuit that we want to study. 
So the biggest surprise to us came when we quantified synapses in this brain region. So here you're seeing a single neuron that's been filled with a dye. Here you're seeing, we're zooming in on a dendritic spine of this uh, dendrite of these neurons, and each one of these protrusions is a dendritic spine. This is what we would call one half of a synapse, uh, which we can use to quantify synaptic numbers in this region. What we found was the opposite of what we expected. So when we knocked out IL-33, either from the, the source from neurons or we knocked out its receptor from microglia, we actually saw fewer synapses rather than more. So in this brain circuit, IL-33 is promoting rather than restricting synapse formation. Um, so how do we explain this paradox? Uh, well, I wanna point out one more piece of data, which is that um, these spines, if you zoom in even further, you'll notice that these have, they have these little protrusions here, which are called spine head filipodia. These are markers of spine plasticity. Um, when a synaptic connection is remodeling or forming, these small buds will often form as a sign that the synapse is in a process of uh, destabilization. Um, these spine head filipodia also depend on IL-33 signaling. And when we knock out IL-33, we see fewer of them. So um, based on these data, we conclude that IL-33 promotes spine uh, and synapse formation and it also promotes synapse plasticity. So the ability of synapses to remodel in response to experience. And one thing that really struck us when we were looking at this data uh, was a recent paper that had come out, excuse me, um, by Cornelius Gross's lab, which performed live imaging uh, of microglia uh, contacting synapses. Now this paper made a couple of important points. One is that they did not observe microglia engulfing synapses. Um, but one phenomenon which they did observe, uh, which I'll orient you to in this video here, here you're looking at a, dendri a dendrite, and here in green you're seeing the dendritic spines that I pointed out to you earlier, so the synapses. And you'll notice that when this microglial process in red approaches the dendrite, um, shortly after that contact, we see this spine forming a spine head filipodia. Uh, in fact, this one as well, if you watch closely, suggesting that something that happens when the microglia contacts the spine um, is promoting synapse plasticity. So that's a hypothesis. So what's happening there? Well, um, one thing that we are trying to do to address this question, since we know that IL-33 also promotes these spine head filipodia, is to understand the molecular programs induced by IL-33 and microglia. Um, and I want to point out one more piece of data that led us to hypothesize um, that IL-33 might be playing a different role than we expect. Uh, and this is uh, based on a finding, and I won't show you the data today, uh, that when we study the behavior in mice that lack IL-33 or the IL-33 receptor, we find that these mice have impaired long-term memories. Um, and we were inspired uh, by a paper by Roger Chen, uh, who was, you know, got the Nobel Prize for a very different topic, but some years before his death, he wrote this intriguing kind of uh, thought experiment, suggesting that memories might be stored in the pattern of holes in the perineuronal net. So I want to explain what he meant by this. Uh, the image that always comes to my mind uh, is this a punch card, which if you've ever seen um, these early form of computer data storage, we have these um, at the Computer History Museum in Palo Alto here in Silicon Valley. Um, these very uh, old types of memory storage um, were based on a series of holes that were punched and encoded specific information. Um, this is the same idea. It's these holes um, formed in the extracellular matrix of the brain that create the space for new synapses to form. Um, and in fact, the brain is full of extracellular matrix, um, which surrounds uh, synapses and surrounds all of the cells in the brain. Um, just like any other tissue, like the kidney or the lung, um, there is extracellular matrix in the brain. Uh, the brain does not have type 1 collagen, uh, which is what we often think of when we think of ECM. We think of um, fibroblasts, we think of type 1 collagen, that's what gives skin its tensile strength. Uh, instead, the extracellular matrix of the brain is mostly composed um, of chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans. Um, which are uh, linked together to the hyaluronic sugar backbone and higher order collagens. And 
Here you can see the hippocampus, the memory region of the brain that I was telling you about earlier. And you can see that one of these chondroitin sulfate proteoglycans, agrican, is very highly enriched uh, in this memory encoding region of the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus. Um, and this is important because the extracellular matrix is known um, to protect synapses when they're young and newborn, but it can also prevent the formation of new synapses when it becomes dense in the aging brain. Um, it, it simply can get in the way of new synapse formation. And so the fundamental point um, of this study, which was published a couple of years ago, um, is that microglia don't just engulf synaptic proteins, but they can also engulf the extracellular matrix. Um, and here you can see evidence of this, that agrican is found within the lysosome, the CD68 positive lysosome of the microglia. Um, and the IL-33 is necessary to promote this ECM engulfment, and it is also sufficient to promote engulfment of the ECM. In this case, we've caused neurons to overexpress um, a form of IL-33 that lacks its nuclear localization signal, and therefore is constitutively secreted from neurons. Um, and now to get back to the molecular point, which I brought up uh, a little bit too soon a couple of slides earlier, um, how can we understand this at, at a molecular level? Um, so work from Leah and Raphael and Ilya in the lab um, has examined uh, what the molecular program is induced by, microglia, by IL-33 and microglia. So here we've done single cell of microglia. These are all microglia here um, that have been exposed to IL-33. And you can see that most microglia are competent to respond to IL-33 signaling. 86% of them respond. Um, and um, perhaps not surprisingly to an immunologist, when we look for phagocytic programs induced by microglia uh, by IL-33, we don't discover any sort of typical phagocytic receptors. Uh, in fact, we see downregulation of some phagocytic receptors. Um, the molecular programs, to briefly summarize, that we see induced by IL-33 induce, in addition to general activation markers, for example, IL-1 beta, um, is a program of pattern recognition, including very potent upregulation of uh, TLRs like TLR2, um, and matrix remodeling, including uh, metalloproteases that are known to remodel um, ECM proteins like agrican, like MMP14. Um, and Adams TS4, which when it was initially discovered was called agrokinase. And so IL-33 signaling um, is driving a kind of uh, recognized and remodel uh, pattern in microglia. And in data that I'm not gonna show, um, one of the things we think is going on is that these um, pattern recognition receptors, which we know recognize all kinds of uh, foreign molecular patterns, can also recognize endogenous molecular patterns like the extracellular matrix itself, whereas these metalloproteases can cleat the extracellular matrix. Um, so we showed in this manuscript that IL-33 expressed by neurons um, essentially drives microglia to remodel the extracellular matrix. Our hypothesis based on this data is that this is a contact-mediated effect whereby microglial contact with synapses, as has been shown by other groups, actually promotes synapse plasticity by leading to a local clearance of the extracellular matrix. And that this may be a multi-step process driven by recognition of the ECM, possibly by TLRs, um, lysis of the ECM by metalloproteases, including MMP14, which is actually a membrane-bound metalloprotease, and that engulfment itself is actually the last step in this multi-step process. Um, so this is a hypothesis that our lab is continuing to actively test. Um, and coming back to the original model then, how does this explain the fact that in development, IL-33 uh, restricts synapse numbers, whereas in adulthood, IL-33 promotes synapse formation? So this comes back to the essential function of the ECM, which is to protect newborn synapses uh, while also preventing the formation of new ones. Um, in early life, the ECM is, is still being accumulated, and this protective function is really important so that when you destabilize the ECM via IL-33, synapses are lost. Whereas in adulthood, um, the ECM has become very dense, um, and, and this preventative function becomes more important. 
Uh, and so we think that that's how the same mechanism can account for these different functions in different brain regions and at different times. Um, and so it's this, uh, basically this work that we've done on IL-33 that has led us to rethink um, microglial synapse interactions, at least from the perspective of this particular signaling molecule. Um, we recently published a very short hypothesis piece on this uh, topic, which I encourage you to read. It came out just a couple of weeks ago, um, where we summarized um, some of the many sort of exciting possibilities for a further deeper dive into the different mechanisms through which microglia um, can regulate synapse numbers. Um, and I encourage you to uh, look it up. So that is part one of the talk. We've shown that the connection between these two excitatory neurons and the remodeling of these synaptic connections is mediated by IL-33. Uh, in the second part of the talk, I wanna switch gears uh, to a totally different cytokine, uh, type one interferons, um, to show uh, a different mechanism uh, through which neural circuits could be remodeled by cytokines, also mediated via microglia. And the idea is, is simple. Um, why remodel these synaptic connections when you could just get rid of the neuron altogether? I know that that sounds dramatic, right? Um, but there are times uh, in our life, uh, particularly in the developing brain and probably in the aging brain, when getting rid of a neuron is the most efficient way to help neural circuits function properly. Um, and that's the mechanism that I'll show you uh, in the next few slides. This is work um, that was initiated by Leah Dorman, um, an excellent graduate student in the lab, um, has been continued by Carolina Scubas, a postdoc in the lab, who's done phenomenal uh, mechanistic work on this, um, and phenomenal contributions by these other folks, um, in particular, Fi Wen, who um, identified some of the first kind of in vivo mechanisms in this project. Um, and this project started uh, not really to study synapse formation at all or, or uh, circuit remodeling, but really to address a, a much more basic question, which is why are microglia so transcriptionally boring, right? Here I'm showing you just as an example, um, a, a UMAP plot of, of interneurons, which are a neuronal cell type in the brain, showing how nicely these cell types cluster in space. Um, you would observe a similar beautiful clustering if you were to look at lymphocytes uh, or any other cell type that has lineage-defining transcription factors and stable identities throughout life. In contrast, when you look at cells like macrophages or microglia, um, you find instead a, a much less exciting degree of heterogeneity. In fact, if this uh, UMAP plot were not color-coded, you would think, you know, well, this is not heterogeneous at all. This is just uh, one type of cell, right? Um, one hypothesis for why is, this is the case is because microglial heterogeneity, macrophage heterogeneity, um, as, as, as shown by Chris Glass in a series of beautiful papers, uh, is driven by state-dependent transcription factors. So transcription factors like NF-kappa-B, um, FOS, AP1 signaling, um, these are factors that are and environmental sensors, right? Um, they are responding to minute changes in the environment. And therefore, these cells are in a continual transition between states. Uh, and that's why when you look at a static fixed time point, um, you don't observe the heterogeneity that we can you know, speculate is there based on their various functions uh, in the tissue. And so we wanted to probe this um, in the developing brain uh, using a very well-established model in neuroscience that's been around since the 1970s. Uh, and it's based on a region of the mouse brain called the barrel cortex. Now, mice um, interact through, with the world uh, by sensing with their whiskers. And in fact, a huge region of their cortex is devoted uh, to their whiskers. If you were to look at their arms and legs in comparison, that would be a very tiny strip of cortex. Um, and this whisker cortex here is organized topographically. Each one of these little circles here represents a single whisker on the face. And it's known that if you lesion the whisker early in life, the entire bill cortex will rearrange so that the area where the whiskers still are takes up more space and the area where the whiskers are gone shrinks. And you can see this here where we've lesioned um, the area where the whisker is grown. You're looking at the cheek of the mouse. 
Uh, and you can see the corresponding change in the cortex with the spared and the deprived barrels. We wanted to drive this broad scale circuit rearrangement to sort of um, impose a stress, but not an injury on the system to understand how the microglia would respond. Um, and here's a UMAP plot um, um, showing what we discovered and focusing on a single population that we observed expanded 20 fold um, during this developmental perturbation. And it is this population here, this cluster eight, which anybody who studied a type one interferons will immediately recognize as a type one interferon responsive microglial population. This is in the absence of any viral perturbation. We have an internal control, which is the uninjured side of the brain in the same uh, clustering paradigm. Um, and, and this is an unmistakable type one interferon response, um, which you know, per GO analysis and what's been published in the literature is um, universally associated with antiviral responses. And so it was a mystery to us why there would be this a potent um, home, homeostatic type one interferon response in the developing brain. In fact, we sat on this project um, for a couple of years, not, not quite knowing what to go with, where to go with it. Um, and a breakthrough in the project came when we um, identified a marker. This is a transmembrane interferon induced protein called IFIDM3, which was able to identify these cells in the brain um, in C2. Uh, and you can see here that the same paradigm that we used before, whisker deprivation, induces the expression of uh, the induces microglia that express uh, these interferon responses. Uh, and what was most exciting is that when we zoomed in on a single microglia, we observed a very striking and unexpected morphology, which is that these microglia um, are engulfing whole neurons. Um, you can't see that in this image. We've shown uh, you, what you can read the paper on bioarchive, actually. We've shown a variety of different ways that the cells that are being eaten by these microglia are neurons. But what you can see here is a single microglial cell. It's got two long processes. This process is reaching across multiple cell diameters to capture a cell, um, which per its DAPI uh, pattern may still be alive, um, while simultaneously it is digesting a cell um, that is already dead. Its nucleus has become deformed. Um, it is in a highly phagocytic state, but rather than the phagocytosis of synapses or ECM um, that are seen in other settings, this is a, a phagocytosis of whole cells. Um, and as you can see here, um, interferon responsive microglia are markedly more likely to have phagocytic cups. And when they do, they are much more likely to have multiple phagocytic cups per cell. Um, and so, you know, phagocytosis is a difficult thing to study in fixed imaging. So we wanted to be able to study this process in real time as well. Uh, and to do this, we've turned to a zebrafish model. Uh, zebrafish, um, as you may know, are transparent up to 12 days after fertilization. And you can directly image the intact developing brain um, of a zebrafish. Um, and observe cell-cell interactions. So this is work done by Haruna Nakaju in the lab. Um, where she labeled microglia with a green reporter and neurons with a red reporter, and then activated type 1 interferon signaling using poly-IC, um, a viral mimic, double-stranded RNA mimic. And what you can see here, if you look in the dotted line, is that this microglia, first of all, its morphology is drastically changed. Uh, you can see these sort of compartments uh, and you can see the engulfment and uptake of an entire neuronal cell body by the microglia, suggesting that type one interferon is accelerating the process of engulfment. Um, to test the necessity of this pathway, we turn to knockout experiments uh, in the rodent. Um, based on the knowledge that um, type one interferon signaling occurs through an obligate receptor, um, of which uh, a major component is IFNAR1. Um, so by knocking out IFNAR1, uh, we were able to begin to examine microglial phenotypes. Um, and one of the first things what we discovered is a markedly um, dysmorphic microglia with multiple enlarged phagocytic compartments, which you can see in this movie here. We're taking a Z-stack through the microglia. Um, each uh, arrowhead indicates a phagosome. Um, and this microglia has three large distended phagosomes each of which contains a diffuse DAPI positive nuclear material, uh, and many of which are larger than the microglial nucleus themselves. 
Um, and so this led to the hypothesis that microglia from IFNAR deficient animals have deficient phagocytosis, uh, which is consistent um, with the uh, physiologic role of microglia that we had observed previously. Um, we defined these microglia with enlarged phagosomes as a bubble microglia uh, in honor of uh, Francesca Perry's group, which had identified deficits in phagocytosis that led to similar distension. Um, and by defining bubble microglia as those where the phagosome was larger than the microglial nucleus, uh, we started to quantify this phenotype across a variety of settings. What you can see here, first of all, um, is that um, bubble microglia exist in the healthy developing brain uh, of the rodent between five and seven postnatal days, um, but they're less than 10% of cells. When you knock out type one interferon signaling, the percentage of bubble microglia increases markedly but only during this restricted phase of early life development, suggesting um, that this is a phenotype that's un uh, uniquely restricted to development, um, possibly because there are some unique developmental stressors or developmental programs happening at this time. Um, secondly, you'll notice that when we knock out the IFNAR1, uh, IFNAR1, the interferon receptor, specifically from myeloid cells using a CX3CR1 CRE allele, um, we um, can recapitulate this bubble microglia effect, suggesting that direct interferon signaling to microglia uh, is what mediates this phagocytic program. And finally, of course, we wanted to understand how this microglial phagocytosis uh, would be impacting neurons, which are um, the cells that encode information in the brain and ultimately the cells that are required uh, for brain function and its functional output. Uh, and I'm showing you the one phenotype that we found tracked through all of our different models and was inversely correlated um, with this microglial phagocytosis deficit. Uh, and this is double-strand DNA breaks. What you're seeing here is a marker called 53BP1, uh, which is normally diffusely localized in the, in the nuclei of neurons. But when a double-strand DNA break occurs, forms these bright puncta. Uh, which you can see highlighted here. Uh, what we found is that when we um, microglia that are defective in type 1 interferon signaling, these mice have an accumulation of these DNA damaged neurons. Whereas when we knock out the signaling from neurons themselves, we see no effect. Um, and importantly, you know, one of the first things we quantified was cell death with tunnel staining, uh, which is end stage DNA damage. Um, and that was not uh, altered uh, in these mice. Um, so this raises the hypothesis, which is actually a very difficult one to test, uh, that these uh, type 1 interferon responsive microglia are engulfing not dead cells, um, but damaged cells, cells which have not yet reached the point of no return. Um, this is an exciting hypothesis, we would, which we would love to test further in an in vivo model, for example, uh, in the zebrafish. Um, but as uh, anyone who's worked with cell death uh, may know, um, it's very difficult to catch cells in the act of dying. Um, so we know that um, uh, type 1 interferon signaling to microglia is driving phagocytosis. We know that it's restricting the accumulation of damaged neurons. Um, I didn't go into this uh, for this audience. Most of this is happening in a particular layer of the developing uh, mouse cortex, which is really important for how that brain region communicates with other brain regions. Uh, for example, um, you know, we know that sight and sound are connected. We know that we interact with our environment through all of our sensory modalities. And this brain region where most of the action is happening is really important for coordinating um, tactile sensation with the other sensations of the body. So it's very important for how uh, we interact with the world. Um, so we were interested how this might be affecting uh, neuronal development in this region and how it might be affecting behavior. Uh, and what I'm showing here is that an excitatory neuronal marker, which is um, highly enriched in these deeper brain regions, uh, is increased uh, in mice that lack type 1 interferon signaling, suggesting that there's an accumulation of excitatory neurons in the brain. Uh, importantly, um, you know, increase in excitation and a decrease in inhibition, I'll talk more about inhibitory neurons in the last part of the talk, uh, is one of the features of autism spectrum disorder. So there's a lot of interest in understanding what balances excitatory and inhibitory neurons in the brain. Um, 
Secondly, um, type 1 interferon signaling has an important phenotype on behavior. And the behavior I'm showing you here is called a whisker sensitivity. It's a very, very simple behavior, um, which Caroline was able to adapt to study um, uh, juvenile mice. And all it is basically is tickling the whiskers of the mouse and seeing how much it bothers them. So you can see that this mouse is not bothered um, by the Q-tip, which is tickling its whiskers. It's eating a little piece of poo. Um, it's unaffected by this perturbation. And Caroline noticed that when she did this experiment, some of the mice would get very upset. They would actually try to bite the Q-tip. Uh, they would run around after the Q-tip. Um, and this um, hypersensitivity to tactile stimulation is what we call whisker nuisance. Uh, and what Caroline found is that interferon deficient mice have a marked increase in this tactile hypersensitivity, both when you globally knock it out or when you knock it out specifically from microglia. Um, so this is a behavioral phenotype, which I will also note um, is kind of a canonical end of phenotype of, of autism spectrum disorder. Um, kids with autism often have sensitivity to touch uh, where moms, uh, parents have to cut off the tags from their clothes. They can have hypersensitivity to sound. Um, wearing uh, headphones can be hurt, very helpful. And although we cannot generalize from human diseases to mouse models, we can notice that these two phenotypes of excitatory inhibitory balance and touch hypersensitivity um, are induced by the sensing of a cytokine uh, by um, microglia and myeloid cells. Um, so our model based on this data is that type 1 interference signaling is driving a very different mode of microglial phagocytosis, which is the engulfment of entire neurons. Um, we are working on defining what the signals are from neurons um, that drive this phagocytic program. I'm happy to talk more about that in the question and answer ses session. We're working to define the sources of type 1 interference signaling in the brain um, in order to sort of further probe deeply into this mechanism. Um, and in the last part of the talk, um, which I have about nine minutes, maybe a little bit more left, um, I want to switch gears. Uh, you've heard about two very different ways in which microglia can regulate circuit function, both of which could lead to the uptake of neurons and neuronal material like synapses, and both of which could restrict synapse numbers, either by eliminating synapses or by eliminating whole neurons. Uh, and in the third part of the talk, I'm going to talk about a mechanism that doesn't depend on microglia at all. Um, and which brings in a very different type of brain circuit function, which is inhibitory synapses, which I will tell you more about um, as I present this data. This work uh, was spearheaded by Jerrica Barron, um, an amazing graduate student in the lab, supported by many other um, very talented folks, including Nick Mraz, um, a graduate student in Ari Malofsky's lab. And uh, this is a... Um, a one-to-one -one collaboration with Ari's lab, um, bringing together sort of his expertise uh, in tissue resident immunity um, and type two immunity and our expertise in brain development. Um, and this story um, came uh, first from the observation from many groups, um, uh, pioneered sort of by Yoni Kipnis group and, and others, um, showing that lymphocytes are present in the meningeal spaces of the brain. Um, and in particular, um, our finding that innate lymphocytes are the predominant cell population in the developing brain meninges. So here we're talking in the first 14 days of life. Um, as you may know, the meninges is a um, lining that surrounds the brain, that encloses the brain and the cerebral spinal fluid, just like the uh, peritoneal lining, the pericardium. Um, it is a protective uh, barrier layer in the brain. Um, and by performing single cell sequencing and enriching for immune cells in the meninges, um, and here zooming in just on lymphocytes, which um, uh, are not the dominant immune cell in the brain, but as we know, lymphocytes are, are key organizing cells in brain function, uh, in immune self and immune, fun immune function in general, including in the brain, as I'll show you. Um, what may not be surprising uh, to anyone who studies innate immunity, um, in early life, uh, innate lymphocytes like gamma delta T cells, ILC1s, uh, and in particular type two innate lymphoid cells, um, uh, group two innate lymphoid cells are predominant uh, and more abundant uh, than uh, T cells. Um, now, 
I want to point out that one of the dominant functions of lymphocytes, including innate lymphocytes, are to produce cytokines. One of the dominant cytokines produced uh, by um, type 2 innate lymphocytes or um, ILC2s, group 2 innate lymphocytes, is interleukin-13. Um, and what we noticed is that not only are these uh, cell types more abundant in early life, um, they produce a surge, uh, what we call a homeostatic surge, uh, of their canonical cytokine, IL-13. And here we're using um, a reporter, um, a transcriptional reporter for IL-13 production uh, produced by Rich Loxley's lab, uh, which we think is a better surrogate for endogenous capacity to produce cytokines than uh, some other approaches, for example, PMA ionomycin, which can test the potential to produce cytokines, but not whether those cytokines are likely to be actively produced uh, in vivo. So we were intrigued by this early postnatal surge because this is a really critical period uh, in synapse assembly. And I will note that this surge is not unique to the brain. In fact, the Loxley group has shown that this uh, surge of IL-13 production is happening all over the body uh, at about this time in development. Uh, we're not sure why that's the case. Um, but in the brain, at least, we know that one of the main functions of this time period is to form synapses. Um, Sorry, my slides are not advancing here. So we wanted then um, to understand more about this process. We can look in situ at the meninges. Um, one, of the region, one of the reasons that this um, rich immune community in the meningeal spaces of the brain was unappreciated for so long, uh, first of all, because immunologists don't study the brain, they usually throw it in the garbage, which is a great pity. Secondly, because neuroscientists, when they do study the brain, they take the skull off and they throw it in the garbage. Uh, and the dural meninges, in fact, is stuck to the skull. If you take the skull, you peel away the dural meninges and you put it flat on the slide, uh, you discover um, a rich community of immune cells, most of which localize to the large vessels of the brain, which you can see here. Um, what we found <clears throat> when we looked at IL-13 producing cells um, in the developing brain is that they expand dramatically in the first 15 days of life. Um, here we're using an IL-13 reporter. Um, Nick uh, flat-mounted meninges and looked at the expression of this reporter. Um, I will say that about 60% of these cells um, are innate lymphocytes, uh, and again, that they localize to the vasculature and meningeal spaces. Um, we get a similar result in a similar early life expansion when we map ILC2s specifically. And what's really important here is that if we look at a similar amount of real estate um, of the brain parenchyma, uh, there is absolutely no evidence of IL-13 expressing cells in the developing brain parenchyma. In fact, the only red that we see uh, in the little bit of meninges that is stuck to the brain when we uh, take it out. So IL-13 producing cells are not present within the brain uh, and any impacts, um, functional impacts, uh, must be mediated from um, cytokine signaling coming from outside of the brain per se. Mm. To study the impact of ILC2s in the brain, we used uh, this genetic model to deplete ILC2s. This is not a complete deletion. Uh, we use uh, the red IL5 reporter to drive Cre uh, and expression of uh, diphtheria toxin, which leads to about an 80% depletion of ILC2s, as you can see here. And we quantified synapses um, in the developing cortex. Um, and here, Jerek is using a very specific, well-known well technique to quantify synapses, where we take a presynaptic protein called VGAT and a postsynaptic protein called Gephrin in two different colors, and we look at where these two proteins um, are co-localized with one another. Uh, there's a sea of synapses in the brain, but we can use algorithms to pick out these co-localized puncta and define functional synapses. And what Jerrica found was a very striking uh, result, which really stuck out to us at this time, because most of the lab was working on IL-33 at that time, which regulates excitatory synapses. Um, ILC2s, by contrast, appear to be regulating inhibitory synapse formation. And when we depleted ILC2s, we see fewer inhibitory synapses. Um, by adulthood, this effect was no longer observed, suggested, suggesting that this effect was unique to the time period um, when we know that ILC2s are producing a surge of interleukin-13. So they're promoting inhibitory synapse density. Importantly, excitatory synapses, which are impacted by IL-33, were not altered. Uh, we can show that uh, 
Nick and Jerrica collaborating together showed that exogenous delivery of ILC2s, which have been activated ex vivo by um, IL-33 and then delivered into the, de the developing brain, is actually sufficient to increase inhibitory synapse numbers, uh, as you can see here. <clears throat> And then, you know, the main question became, what is the cell cellular target and what is the mechanism of this effect? Um, and I want to point out a key thing. These inhibitory synapses, which I've been showing you in these very zoomed in pictures, a single synapse is about a half a micron in size. These synapses are formed uh, by inhibitory neurons. Um, inhibitory neurons are basically like the Tregs of neural circuits, right? So the information itself is encoded in the signaling between inc excitatory neurons, but inhibitory neurons are extremely powerful because they can turn on and turn off uh, these circuits uh, and are very important in tuning brain function. So of course, loss of inhibition is implicated, implicated in many, many brain disorders, including epilepsy, autism, and many others. Um, and we know that ILC2s produce IL-13. Uh, and we know, uh, we started to look then whether um, IL-13 signaling would be relevant to some of the phenotypes we observed, uh, since it signals through an obligate receptor, which includes the IL-4 receptor. I will note that um, IL-4 is not produced um, during this early stage of development, although we can't absolutely rule out an effect of IL-4. Um, what we found is that when we looked at IL-4 receptor knockout animals, we see the same impact on inhibitory synapses, and again, no impact on inhibitory excitatory synapses, phenocopying what we saw in ILC2 deficient animals. Uh, when we deliver IL-13 directly into the brain, we see an increase in inhibitory synapses, and again, no impact on excitatory synapses, similar to what we saw when we delivered IL ILC2s to the brain. And finally, uh, we wanted to understand what cell type is mediating this effect. And Jerrica spent about two years knocking out um, the IL-4 receptor specifically from microglia, from myeloid cells, in all kinds of different ways, and there was no effect. So this is not an effect that's happening via signaling to microglia. And finally, uh, we turn to the neurons themselves. So work uh, from many labs, um, including Gloria and Choi and Jun Ho's group, uh, the Kipnis lab and others has shown that cytokines can signal it directly to neurons. And what Jerrica found is that when she knocked out the IL-4 receptor directly from inhibitory neurons, she was able to phenocopy the effect of ILC2 deletion by observing a reduction in inhibitory synapses and no reduction uh, in excitatory synapses, um, suggesting that this is a direct signaling loop from IL-13 to inhibitory neurons. And finally, um, Jerrica studied the impact of this um, signaling circuit on behavior. Um, and this is a very commonly used behavioral paradigm that studies, um, that is meant to model social interaction in mice. Um, so mice are social animals. They don't like to be alone. Uh, and if you put them in a chamber that's got three um, compartments, uh, one of which has a mouse. Um, it's a mouse that never been seen before um, under a cup. This is a wire cup so that the mouse can smell and sniff the other mouse. And then you put an empty cup in the other compartment. And then you put our test mouse here in the middle of the chamber. We can measure um, how much time is spent in the social chamber versus the empty chamber. And here you're looking from above, you're seeing a heat map of the little mouse moving around. Um, the mouse makes a beeline for the cups. It doesn't wanna stay alone here in the middle. And you see that most, uh, could, most um, wild type mice will head straight for the social chamber and spend a lot of time sniffing and interacting with the mouse uh, and spend much less time uh, sniffing this empty cup. Um, in mice that lack ILC2s, uh, Jerrica observed, and this was in collaboration with Sunray Taloma in the lab, um, that this preference was markedly reduced. So you can see this quantified here where there's a preference for the social chamber um, and a diminished um, preference for the social chamber in ILC2 deficient mice. Um, this can be quantified as a discrimination index here. I won't go into, you can see them. Um, the calculation that's done here on the side, we can see that their ability to discriminate is reduced in ILC2 deficient animals. Um, and importantly, um, when we knock out the IL-4 receptor, specifically from interneurons, not only do we phenocopy that reduction in inhibitory synapses, but we also phenocopy this uh, reduction uh, in social interaction. 
so based on this data, which is currently um, under review, uh, we've developed a model um, that this neuroimmune signaling loop um, between ILC2s and neurons mediated via interleukin-13 uh, drives inhibitory synapse formation during this critical weird period of brain development. Um, that ILC2s produce a wave of IL-13 in early life, um, that shortly following this wave, um, it, they drive um, a production of inhibitory synapses um, via IL-13. We can see via gain or loss of function approaches that inhibitory but not excitatory synapses are altered. Um, and that this um, role uh, during this critical period of brain development uh, is important for promoting social behavior. Um, and so to summarize what I've shown you, I've shown you three very different mechanisms mediated through three completely different cytokines um, through which cytokines can drive uh, important changes of brain connectivity uh, that are relevant to behavior via interleukin-13, via type 1 interference, uh, and via IL-33. Uh, and I want to thank my lab. I thanked along the way many of the major players. This is driven um, through um, essential collaboration and talk between all of my lab members, current and past, um, between um, a key collaborator and many of these studies, Ari Malofsky's group, uh, and by other collaborators, um, which I will mention here, including Mason Kierbeck, um, who has um, um, is our expert in hippocampal circuitry and helped us with those studies. Um, Tom Nowakowski, who advised on single cell sequencing, uh, Chris Glass, who contributed to studies on IL-33 function, uh, Rich Loxley, uh, and others. Thanks to my funding, and I am excited to take your questions via Twitter offline. Well, thanks, Anna, for a really, really fascinating, outstanding talk. I mean, I found it so fascinating to see how those players that we think to know so well and what other kind of functions they actually do in this interaction with the immune system. So I found this really fascinating. And uh, yeah, as you said, uh, thanks for everything. We have to make our usual sharp cut here. So we all love probably to ask very many questions, but I have to refer you all to the page formerly known as Twitter or the platform formerly known as Twitter for questions. And with that, uh, I'd like to thank you again. I want to close our seminar. And the, but last thing I want to say is, of course, look all forward to seeing you again next week when our speaker will be Bart Lambrecht. Now, I wish you all a remaining nice day or a nice evening. Bye-bye.